Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, everyone, to the philosophy of art and science. Today, our special guest is Joshua Alfaro. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Thank you. Thank you for coming to the program. There are um, a million topics that we can talk about, but why don't we start off with a simple one? How do you generally introduce yourself? Yeah, so I'm Joshua Alfaro, as you said. Um, yeah, I'm finishing up my PhD at the University of Salzburg, and um, I'm working on the Book of Esther. I mostly study uh, Septuagint, meaning the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament, whatever you want to call it. But I'm also interested in what we call the daughter versions in Septuagint studies. So meaning these versions that are translated from the Septuagint, which itself is a translation, and this means basically the Old Testament of the Eastern churches. So, for example, the Armenian, the Coptic, and of course the Gez uh, Old Testament. So today I'm not really here to talk about my own studies, but I thought it would be interesting to you and your audience to talk about a session I attended recently at the um, Society of Biblical Literature conference that was on the Gez Bible. Yes. Um... I, I might have a question or two for you at the end because um, that work that you do is always near and dear to my heart. But yeah, the, the Society of Biblical Literature is sometimes shortened for SBL. I try to get away from jargon, so I'm I'm glad that you said the whole title too. Sometimes yeah. people are in their in their niches and they use uh, jargon that others don't understand. But thank you for saying the full thing. Uh, going forward, we could say SBL because we'll assume people have heard that. Sure. But um, either Society of Biblical Literature or SBL. Um, how like who who exactly comes to these things because by the way i have listened to and uh like recordings from there and i have uh seen uh transcripts that i've read from there before from selecting the work of the late um dr michael heiser who him and some of his friends used to be there um also a friend of mine dr richard benton and um dr Jeannie constantino they used to be in the the eastern orthodox meets oriental orthodox uh, kind of subsections but who all goes to the society of biblical literature and and how did it come yeah. on your radar yeah yeah good question yeah so society of biblical literature meets every november and basically i try to find the exact figures i can't i can't find attendance figures but i think i heard somewhere like 3000 or more Wow. scholars descend on some American city. I mean, it's gotten so big. They used to have it in Atlanta, and I think Atlanta is just too small. So it's it's in a different U.S. city every year. They also meet the same time as American Academies of Religion. So you have thousands of biblical scholars, religion scholars, and everybody related to that in some American city at some time, meeting in this huge uh, convention center. And it's on pretty much any topic imaginable related to biblical studies. So you might have one room where there's like um, historical Semitic linguistics. And then next door, they've got like feminist perspectives on Genesis. <laughs> and the next door is like um, Pentecostal approaches to the book of Ezekiel or something like that. So there's any approach, any topic imaginable basically. And here I'm going to talk about the, the Ge'ez Bible session. It's actually called the the session is called the Ethiopic Bible and Literature Unit. So I know, as uh, Bereket said on Twitter recently, Ethiopic is not really not really accurate term for Gez, right? It's not it's not the best term probably we have, but for better or worse, scholars refer to it as the Ethiopic Bible. And yeah, I think I, yeah. I, I would say just sorry briefly. Um, it it. Obviously, the endonym is Giz, and the exogen mm -hmm. is Ethiopic or Ethiopic, mm -hmm. and relating to Ethiopia. And even the word Ethiopia itself has so many different contexts that so many people could just sit there talking about Ethiopia. Like, I can tell you a small controversy amongst some very foolish people uh, in Ethiopian communities and, and adjacent communities was there was some... I think new translation of scripture going on and they replaced even I think all of the New Testament references to Ethiopia with the word Kush which comes from oh, the Hebrew yeah, yeah. and and people said oh are you destroying Ethiopia from the Bible you know um so I, I think a lot of these you know name arguments um 
I had tip Shakespeare. What's in a name? A rose by any other scent would smell as sweet. I, I, I don't get into them. And I think particularly with our Eritrean brothers and sisters, it's, um, it's, a, it's a particularly source uh, topic because there are uh, contributions of, of theirs as well. Um, but I think the kind of plain truth is it's, um, you know, it's within the orbit of whatever is larger. It reminds me of the conversations of some of the people in South Asia versus the Indian subcontinent. Right, you have Bangladesh, Pakistan, you have even Sri Lanka and Nepal, if you want to include, and some of those conversations that that people have, or even the word America. Right, if you're situated in South America, are you America or is it only the United States? But I, right. I try to focus just on the on the the content of it. I'm I'm curious, is it just an oddity of your personal interest to have attended these e Ethiopic or G is sessions? Or is G is because I've heard of Professor Efrem Misak, a longtime Semitic language scholar of uh, our own and of Yemeni uh, persuasion, he has said that it's one of the first seven languages in which scripture was translated into. And so it has importance in that way. But uh, are are you alone in your interest, or are there a lot are there a lot of people interested in Gaz? Yeah, I would say like worldwide, there's plenty of people doing it. It's not one of the better attended sessions. It's not like everybody's like I want to go to this session. You know, there's there's all these other sessions people might want to go to. So this is part of why I like want to have it on other people's radar. Maybe make this um this talk here so other people can be aware of what these scholars are doing. Otherwise, you know, you have a room about. 15 people who are experts in their field, but the public at large might not hear much about these presentations. So, yeah. Absolutely. And I love the word the daughter, by the way. We use similar language. There's this word awalid, which is uh, daughters in Giz. And they refer to patristics in that way. Uh, things that they call them the daughters of scripture, the, the various yeah. patristic literature. So it's interesting that you all use that um, similar language. I think the first paper uh, you had uh, looked at or heard was uh, oral and written Beit Israel traditions of the Decalogue. What could you say yeah. about uh, your attending of that session? Yeah, maybe first I'll say a little bit more on Ethiopic, this term. I'm not trying to get into controversy or whatever, but, and I'm, I'm going to use Gez because that's what all the, the talks were about. But I think they're trying to be like inclusive because in theory, in principle, you could, a scholar could present a paper on another Ethiopic, uh, Ethiopian language, right? Uh -huh. So a few years ago, um, I don't know if you've heard of Sofani Abebe, who does, I think, New Testament studies. She did a paper um, that included some Amharic. So that would be the kind of rationale between, for them, I think, using this term Ethiopic Bible and literature. And it could also include, they have sessions, um, they have papers on, geographical literature it's not just the bible also it could mm -hmm. be liturgical stuff so i'm going to use gaze because that's what the papers i attended were on beautiful but in principle it could be anything about different languages related to ethiopia yeah that makes sense yeah so i'll, I'll talk about the first paper a bit yeah um this was really interesting. This was by a paper by a professor at uh, Tel Aviv University named Dalit Rom Shiloni. And this paper was titled Oral and Written Beta Israel Traditions of the Decalogue. So it was about these oral traditions of the Ten Commandments. And maybe first we should kind of talk about what is Beta Israel. I mean, not not many people are aware of what they are just because demographically they've always been, you know, a small minority. So maybe maybe you know I don't know what 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 do you know about Beta Israel? Yeah, there are about a couple hundred thousand of them in total. I would say the majority are in the state of Israel today, and uh, <laughs> without commenting on the conflict there, you could see uh, using the term propaganda neutrally, just saying promotion of one side. They're very visible in the presentation. There's even one that. Um, Republicans have chosen to replace George Santos in a congressional seat, and she was born in Ethiopia. So it's very interesting. They're becoming more and more um, visible. The last I checked, this could be changed. The Israeli ambassador to Ethiopia was also Beta Israel. So th there's a lot of social mobility for them within the IDF, within the Israeli Defense Force, within the military, more so than in um, other occupations, as I've seen it, and then, you know, other government positions related to 
experience gotten from the military. But yeah, there are a lot of um, different views. If you take their own story at face value or some of the other stories that uh, could be considered legends or myths swirling around Ethiopia is that they are a kind of lost tribe of Israel and have always been there. Another story is that they are converts from merchants and traders that would have come in the first few centuries, perhaps after Christ. And yet again, another version of the story that um, I personally find to be more viable is that they seem to be um, ago, which is related to some of the linguistic evidence found in their text, which by the way, everyone in Ethiopia is some type of ago, uh, an ago mix. It's a, it's a type of uh, Kushite, not, not in the biblical sense, but related to that word, Cushitic language uh, speaker, which is in the larger Afro-Asiatic family, which Hebrew, Syriac, and Giz, and Amharic, and all that are in, but that they were uh, somehow being Christianized or were Christian, and then through theological controversies or just uh, anger at the at the center, which was subsuming them, they reverted back on their own to a, a pre or an extra Talmudic form of Judaism that they kind of ad hoc constructed. And so these are kind of several theories that I have heard. I don't know if you leaned towards any of them. Yeah, I mean, I just read a bit about it, and the paper wasn't, to be honest, wasn't like about their origins per se mm -hmm. so yeah i'm just aware i'm not aware of all the things you just mentioned so that's good to know but um basically i'm aware that there's controversy and, and or or different traditions we could say even among their own community i think there's different traditions of whether they're a lost tribe or whether they um, just refused to convert when the kingdom of Aksum converted to christianity or what and then secular scholars who are not in that community also have different ideas and i'm not sure there's like one consensus either even even among people outside the community yeah as far as i know there's a scarcity of resources during the Aksumite period which would have ended around 900 or 1000 a.d and so it it's hard to say what what happens in that time frame but there's a sort of clearer tra paper trail from the medieval proper like medieval period for us, which kind of begins in 1270 till the present. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, even even as early as 1270, yeah. Okay, yeah. What I had what I had read is like at least at least since the 16th century for sure, there were these people calling themselves Beta Israel by their own designation in Ethiopia, and we would say they're basically. Ethiopian Jews, the Ethiopian Jewish community, although they don't tend to use Jewish per se, but Beta Israel. Yeah, house, so of, been, house of Israel. House of, house of Israel, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So they're observing uh, practices found in the Hebrew Bible, like the dietary customs and the holy days and things like that. And then where this paper comes in is more recently. So they had been living in Ethiopia since at least the 16th century, if not earlier. But more recently, in I think the 1980s, starting their uh, the government in Ethiopia, the communist government was kind of banning them or persecuting them, and there was this kind of mass migration to Israel, to the state of Israel, and Israel was quite happy to give them support for that, although. Of course, anybody migrating from a different culture like that, even if they're they're identifying as Jewish, you can understand why the other people, uh, other European Jews or Israelis, are going to look at them with kind of some kind of skepticism. And so, there's different views, I think, among Israelis, uh, Jewish people, but officially, the state of Israel recognizes them as Jews. But not all of their practices. Um, yeah, right, right. There, there are uh, you know accounts of sort of individual uh racism some bus driver spits on you or some citizen spits on you there are reports that it's not it's not clear how widespread there are but of some sterilization um and and that's pretty egregious if not the most egregious the the interesting thing about the religious rights which we're most interested in is um the most like it i don't i don't want to say anti-talmudic but if you could come up with a better word uh the the largest i think 
contradiction or tension between their community and the existing Jewish communities that were in the state of Israel is that being outside of uh, the rabbinic revolution, they kept their Kohanim or their priests. And they so they have the Kesoch, which you wrote a little bit about in uh, our notes. And the, the word case is the same word used for priest in in uh, Giz, and it's related to the, the Syriac Ashisho too. It just means similar to Kohen, like a, a servant of the temple. Um, or, or some people say it means elder as well, like the Greek term presbyter. Um, and, and in fact, presbyter is translated, the Greek presbyter is translated in the New Testament as Asis, which is Damharic case and plural Kesoch. And so they have priests of their own. And there was something that I have read that the state of Israel was not allowing them to have government benefits unless they sort of uh, got rid of their priesthood. So the current priests alive are able to maintain their priesthood, but that they're not allowed to continue that discipleship and sort of create new priests. Because that would create a situation in oh. which the only priests in Israel are all Beta Israel, which yeah. would be... Uh, it would be very unique. It would be almost like the Sadducees, like a, a separate sect within yeah, yeah. the society. Interesting. Yeah, actually, I didn't know that at all. So that that really helps actually the background to this paper, um, which was basically about recording the oral traditions of these elders, of these uh, priests. And the project is, um, yeah, it's an official academic project out of Tel Aviv University. They created a whole MA program um, devoted to this. I think they're trying to get a PhD program also. Beautiful. And basically what they have is they have um, Israeli students of Ethiopian descent who are, the project is about recording these oral traditions of scripture interpretation. So um, the issue seems to be with the background you gave that um, there's not many elders and these elders are limited even by the state in, in how much they can do, how much they can disciple, as you said. So there's a real cultural heritage issue where um, this community could lose their oral traditions that they've had for you know, who knows how many years. It's hard to date, but um, there could they could totally lose these traditions. So what they're trying to do is record them. And the, this paper was specifically on the Ten Commandments. And so um, if what, what I would describe it is, is something like um, interpretive performances of scripture. So basically, you have the biblical text of the Ten Commandments, but you might find interspersed kind of liturgical exclamations or clarifying additions. So an example would be like, um, it says, the scripture text, the Bible text says, you shall not be subject to other gods besides me. And then the oral tradence, the tradition, wants to clarify that a little bit and say there's no any gods whatsoever. So they add this word, whatsoever. And how it was explained to the researchers, the um, kind of guardians of the oral tradition, explain that. And they said, basically, it's intended to be a, a sort of polemic against Christianity, that we shouldn't worship any other gods, you know, not, not this other god from the Christians, but whatsoever is meant to kind of be this intensifying um, expression here. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. Um... I find that a lot in in Hebrew and in Giz and Amharic. Uh, I, and I assume these are, are do they say whether the interpretations are orally preserved in Giz or in Amharic? Or right, both? yes. Yeah, so they are in Giz. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. They are in Giz and then they're making transcriptions of them in Giz. And um, at least for this, we were, the handout had an English translation to help us. Yeah. So th there's, it's a very common thing to have. Um, there's this word bazu, which means many, and then they have another thing they call you bazu bazu, which is like many, many, <laughs> like exceedingly, <laughs> exceedingly many, tremendously many, and yeah. and you see that often uh, when they want to emphasize a case. That's that's wonderful. And there was um, another paper that that you heard also. Um, this one excited me a lot because I own a copy of the of the product <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. uh, of the recent commercial Giz Bible that the Ethiopian Orthodox Tawahado Church released. Yeah, yeah, right. So this paper was by uh, Nebeyu A.T., I guess that's how you say his name, um, 
who is at the University of the Free States, and he also works with Wycliffe, uh, Ethiopia, the translators. So yeah, this 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 paper was about this newly published single volume Goethe's Bible. So I was going to ask you, have you ever seen a Goethe's Bible before? You yes. have. So you have this one. Yes. Uh, let me see if I <laughs> I got something behind me. <laughs> okay. Okay. So uh, this right here. And uh, I think I gave my New Testament to someone else, but they had the New Testament by itself. And then this is So it's the Octatuk plus the Book of Jubilees. Oh, okay. um, and this was published around the mid 20th century in Asmara. So because of the Italian colonial influence in Asmara, modern day Eritrea, um, they they had certain modern technologies like printing presses and buildings that they established and then obviously after they were kicked out <laughs> uh the the italians the um those things are still in use and so this came on the back of camels from asmara to addis ababa to mercato to the the large bazaar and uh, my aunt picked it up from the bazaar there, and the guy was explaining to her that it came on camelback. Uh, wow. And so I, <laughs> it's one of my prized possessions. Before they had a single volume, that's what I had to do is I had a uh, to get a physical book. There are online resources as well, but I wanted yeah. Uh, yeah. a print book. There was New Testament fully by itself, and then there was um, there was the Octatuk plus the Book of Jubilees. Now, the issue with that is obviously you don't have the whole Old Testament. It's like nine books there. Uh, the first eight books plus Jubilees. And then the second issue is uh, it it wasn't from the Ethiopian Orthodox Tawada Church. I'm not exactly sure who it was from. It just says it's from a printing press. So I don't know if it was from Eritrean Catholics or I don't know who uh, the main kind of producer of these works were. And so th this new thing that you're uh, that you were listening to about it has the sign of the Holy Synod of the Ethiopian Orthodox Tawahado Church. It has a message from the Patriarch, uh, His Holiness and His Beatitude, Abu Namathias. And, uh, you know, they would go through a process of their own editing and vetting that I think gives it a little bit more seriousness or, um, I don't know what to say, like a, a seal of approval that I personally would, would trust. And before all of this, you have the traditional schools called Abinet, that there might be one book per school. Uh, maybe sometimes they have more. And a lot of times, uh, just like ancient times, they wouldn't necessarily be in a scroll, but they would be like handwritten, uh, like manuscripts written on goat skin. And you don't necessarily always have everything. There's this very alluring story of a 20th century scholar, Alek Akidana Wal Kifle, who the, the the commentary tradition was missing a book of Ezekiel commentary. And so he traveled to Jerusalem and lived there for a couple decades, learns Hebrew, Arabic, Syriac, so that he could compare everything, comes back to Ethiopia, and then reintroduces a commentary for Ezekiel for the rest of the church that was missing it. That, that I mean, they had the text, but they didn't have a commentary. And, yeah. and so um, it, it was just very, I don't know, splotchy is a good word to say, like it was hit or miss. It was not very standardized. And I think a lot of it had to do with kind of poverty and scarcity of resources and technology. Yeah, yeah, that's super interesting, that story. Yeah, like people will just go travel and, and study just to kind of recover, yeah, a book and commentary. Um, yeah, so I, I, what's interesting to me about this was the, the single volume aspect. Like you're saying most almost all all the all the bibles before all the editions of scripture were in multiple volumes and so as a result people might not have a whole scripture canon in a single area and it's funny i've i've heard people ask me like where can i get a his bible yeah. and before this year you couldn't there's no such thing you just yeah. you couldn't buy a single volume and we have to remember um the ethiopian orthodox church has more books than protestants and Catholics, and even the other Eastern and Oriental Orthodox churches. So when you have more books, it's harder to get them all in one cover. And um, 
uh, for me, it just raises this interesting question of like, what is the Bible? Because especially in the Protestant tradition, it's very common for people to emphasize like individual Bible study. And you might have a lot of people in some churches will bring their personal Bible to church, but it hasn't been that way for most of history. I mean, in most churches, most throughout history, there hasn't been a single volume Bible. You might have a Psalter, you might have a book of gospels, you might have parts of the Old Testament, but it's not, it's a very recent phenomenon to have this single volume Bible. Absolutely. I can tell you, I don't have to go far. My parents um, and and my grandparents, when, when my grandfather was coming up, he was born in 1905, there was not even a commercial Amharic Bible. And, and then the Protestant missionaries came and he actually, um, I have his physical Bible he bought from the Lutherans, I think in like 1919 or 1920. And the Ethiopian church, uh, the Orthodox didn't put one out until I think the fifties or something. And that was at the behest of Emperor Haile Selassie. If he had left them to their themselves, they might not have even done that. Uh, when my parents were kids and certainly my both, all my four of my grandparents, I, I'm glad you mentioned the Psalter. The three important books that they used to teach you how to read is the Psalter, the Psalms of David, the um, first John, and, and, and fascinatingly, usually just first John chapter one. Okay. And then, <laughs> And then the entire Gospel of John. And so um, in ancient processions of the church, often they would take out just the Gospel of John by itself and a, a processional cross, and they would do a procession. And so people, some people's households in small prayer books and by themselves would have just the Gospel of John by itself, or uh, maybe the Gospel of John with First uh, John, chapter one, just chapter one. Yeah. Um, overwhelmingly, I'd say the number one thing people had was the Psalter. And I have, um, from my grandmother and from her like seven to nine generations, I don't know how old it is. I'd have to get somebody to date it, but I got a family heirloom that is a Psalter that's hundreds of years old. And, uh, to your point, Psalters and like the book of Job and the gospels are the things we have evidence of in Ethiopia from even the Aksumite period from 400s, 500s, 600s, 700s, 800s, 900s. So those things, but like by themselves. So very scarce. And yeah, I get that question that you get all the time too. Where can I get a Giz Bible? The follow-up is where can I get the Giz Bible in English? Yeah. <laughs> good luck. I don't think that exists. Yeah, good luck. Yeah. 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 Right. yeah. There's no such thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was just interesting, like just this concept of like what is the Bible? And it's not as if people didn't have a concept of what is scripture and what is not. But as a physical book, as a, as a material artifact, what the Bible has been has not been a single book for most of history, for the Ethiopian church, for any church. And um, it's interesting, like a lot of these medieval Bibles in the Western churches, they would have maybe a New Testament and then some church fathers included in the same manuscript or a Psalter and then some other devotional text or something. And so this, it's not like they didn't, some people like to say, well, so the canon was still loose and they didn't, that's not really true. It's not like they didn't know what's in the canon and what's not. But the physical thing they call the Bible could include other texts that now we don't think of as the Bible. Absolutely. And I know by the, by the kind of demographics of attendees that you were saying, I imagine it's a mix of people who come from faith backgrounds and people who don't or who yep. express it in maybe non-traditional ways. The knowledge of the sausage machine is how I believe some people have kind of lost faith. But for me personally, it has kind of increased my faith to see the human element, but to kind of still see God behind everything. I may ask you about this at the end, sure. but in your experience, does, um, when you see people like at this session or at others that you may have attended, does um, like, are they drawn by faith? Does it hurt their faith? Does it increase their faith? Is there anything like that that you've ever seen or heard? Yeah, yeah, good question. Yeah, I like to joke that the Society of Biblical Literature annual meeting is the time of the year when 
all these scholars join and pretend they're not religious people. <laughs> because the truth <laughs> is the vast majority of people who are interested in the Bible academically come from some kind of faith background. That's the truth. But at these kind of professional, scholarly, academic meetings, we all kind of bracket that to some extent. In some sessions, there might be a more kind of open acknowledgement of um, your tradition. And it's not like anybody's feeling the need to hide what, where they're from. You know, a lot of people mm -hmm. work at seminaries or are active in their faith communities, or they might be uh, ordained or whatever. But we kind of try to bracket all of that. It's just a, it's just a funny phenomenon to me is, um, yeah, trying to like put this, this thing we really care about, this spiritual thing most of us care about, and let's try to like turn it off for a second to study this as a historical document. Yeah, yeah I was going to ask you, is it attributable more to kind of not having doctrinal disputes openly? So it's kind of like a polite thing, don't discuss religion and politics at the dinner table or the gala? Or is it more that... Uh, and it almost sounds like what you were saying at the end, it's a, it's the, what they try to do in newsrooms, or at least they used to, is aiming for objectivity in approaching the scriptures. Yeah, I think that's the idea. I mean, that's kind of the, the maybe enlightenment, European heritage of biblical studies is we want to try to be objective. We want to try to get past um, differences between Jews and Protestants and Catholics and, um, we're just we want to try to be on all the same page which is good i think that's fine um and i think more recently there's been a more acknowledgement of like well nobody can be completely objective and we all have biases whether it's cultural or um, religious background or whatever and we're probably better off acknowledging that in some way but you're not going to find somebody at, at, a, at a session kind of saying, here, I'm going to prove that, you know, the book of Job is true or <laughs> that's just not going to go. <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious. Um, it, it, three and four were about some manual and computer processes. Could you, yeah. could you talk about that? This is interesting because I've, I've dealt with this type of thing before and I got to tell you, I, um, I'm really bad at reading manuscripts. Like I could obviously read them cause I read these languages, but I get a lot of letters confused. I, I can't say hundred percent accuracy. Like what, what were these sessions about? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Maybe I'll preface this about kind of, um, where does the Bible fit in biblical studies as a whole? What is it kind of doing there? What is its kind of role? Um, of course, native Ethiopian scholars and scribes have their own scholarly traditions over generations. But I can only speak for kind of Western scholarship and say, at least in the past, there's been a major interest among Western scholars of like so-called lost books of the Bible. So the Book of Enoch and Jubilees especially are only fully preserved by the Ethiopian church. Uh, by the scribes. And so Westerners were super interested in that because otherwise it was lost to them. Well, it wasn't really lost. It was only lost to Westerners, right? The whole time the Ethiopian church was preserving it. So that's been something that's historically been of a lot of interest to Westerners. More recently, though, um, scholars, including Western scholars, are recognizing because the Bible as an object of study in its own right not just as a means to some other end, like we're trying to reconstruct the original Hebrew version of Enoch. Some people still try to do that, but there's more recognition of, um, let's treat this subject of worthy of interest in its own right. So this is kind of where this session um, comes in with these last two presenters. So I'm grouping together the last two papers. Um, the third paper was called Manual and Computer Processes for the Te Study of the Textual History of Ethiopic Manuscripts by Gary Yost. And the fourth was on Minority Variants in the Oldest Ethiopic Biblical Manuscripts by Steve Delamarter and Ralph Lee. All of these guys are connected to this project, which is called um, the Textual History of the Ethiopic Old Testament. 
and what they're doing is collaboration of Western and um, native Ethiopian scholars are basically they're trying to record the whole textual history as, as far as they can and record all the manuscripts as much as they can and figure out kind of the variations between them. So where the computer processes come in is they're, they're finding some things they can automate. Once they have kind of the variance catalog, you can get the computer to tell you where, where the manuscripts cluster alongside each other so they can fit them in kind of clusters. And this is an example of this kind of more recent approach is they, they will say multiple times, they're not trying to get to the oldest uh, Aksumite Bible. To me, that's interesting. I want to get yeah. to the oldest next my Bible, but that's not their project per se. I mean, they're interested in the whole um, centuries-long history of how these texts were transmitted over time. And so more of an object of study in its own right, rather than I want to get to the oldest original whatever. And so, um, yeah. yeah, that's kind of their project and they're presenting on that. It's very interesting. I had a uh... A good friend of mine, Deacon Alam Asalasi, on my program recently, and he has um, published a book with Agora University Press recently about variants in scripture. Particularly, he was looking at Genesis 37 3, the Technicolor dream coat of Joseph. Um, but he was looking at a lot of different areas, even looking at the Chronicles of the Kings, which were written by some of the same Debtara or scribes that would be writing the biblical commentaries. And um, what he, one of the, the things that he found out of the mouths of the scholars themselves is that oldest Aksumite Bible is not even what they were interested in because sometimes the oldest one is in their words, defective or erroneous. And so some of their open-mindedness and uh, seeking led them to search for manuscripts from all over the world, obviously with their technological, um, their lack of technology, the closest places that they would go is like the Near East, like the, um, it, whether it's Egypt to the north or to the northwest uh, from the coastline, just 20 kilometers away, you have Yemen and Saudi Arabia. Um, and, and a lot of the Church of the East maybe before they were kind of decimated by the Mongols and, and other groups, you had a lot of literature coming from East and West Syriac. You have a, a it's strange sometimes to, to the point where the British in a lot of their writings would call us a Coptic entity, but oftentimes, especially in the patristic and scriptural tradition, we have a lot of similarities with the school of Antioch and with the, the Western Syriac fathers. In fact, our whole, we have a whole book of monks in which there are three authors, all of which are from the Church of the East, most famous of whom is Isaac the Syrian, but there are others as as well. So it's it's fascinating that that they're using um, these variants to find that and these uh, computer processes. Does that mean they themselves are learning like data analysis and data science, or are they also collaborating with like computer people? Right. I think the main guy on this project who is kind of the, um, yeah, computer you know, programmer technician is uh, Gary Yost, J-O-S-T. Um, and he has been yeah, designing basically Google scripts for different processes to kind of, yeah, basically what they're interested in is in making groups, you know, finding out um, how these manuscripts are related and if possible, putting them in groups. That's amazing. Yeah, I wanted to show this is not going to benefit the audio listeners, but the video listeners. This is, for example, from a, a hymnal called Zimmare and Mawase. It's one of those of St. Yared. And if uh, the video uh, watchers will be able to see that this is manuscript like uh, writing that was then kind of typefaced, but not put in a typeface font. And it frustrates me when I look at it because it's so small. And it's it's in a different font or style that is almost like a cursive, not quite, but it's its own calligraphy. And I've kind of grown accustomed to the modern uh, typefaces, although there's a gentleman, uh, I think Dan Daniel Jacob or Daniel Yaakov on Twitter or X that also posts all these different fonts that people could use. And it is something that people actively look at.
at, at this point, I, I would love to ask you uh, kind of more related to to your personal scholarship amongst the the daughters that are there. How, how do you look at is in 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 text form in manuscript form like do you look at it for esther is it is it helpful at all is it is there anything there that wasn't in the septuagint or whatever other daughter translations there are right yeah yeah good question yeah i mean the the results of this textual history of the ethiopic old testament project what one, one of their main findings is the textual tradition is really quite stable I mean, wow. some people have this idea of all oh, these scribes were copying the Bible over centuries and, you know, some priest just added something he, you know, wanted to emphasize or people have this idea that scribes could just add anything whenever they wanted. But that's totally not true. I mean, the vast majority of the variants are these kind of very minor things like um, the older the older traditions might have the Lord lifted. And then the more new, the newer, um, the Lord lifted my head because they wanted to revise it to the Hebrew, which had my head, and they wanted to make sure it matches the Hebrew or something like that. So overall, the um, this Bible is very, very stable. I mean, the, the variants are very minor things, like a pronoun here and there. You're not going to get like one manuscript that says uh, God exists and another manuscript that says there's a bunch of other gods you know you're never gonna yeah. have something like that and so i'm as a kind of academic interested in these things um i'm interested even in these minor variants you know and they're they're not necessarily going to help me um reconstruct the oldest septuagint but i'm interested in oh you know somebody made an error here and this affected this stream of the textual tradition or um you know there was a pronoun inserted here and that affects the text in a little way but to me these things are still like super fascinating same i always noticed for example from genesis and this is a larger theme that i i wonder where you land in there's this idea of you know word for word versus thought for thought or dynamic versus literal and you can say adam died death or you could say adam died yeah. And this Semitic usage of the noun and the verb back to back for me is a form of emphasis. You see it in the scroll of Ezekiel as well. One of my favorite lines, I think it's from chapter 17, where in the Hebrew, he says, you will riddle a riddle and parable a parable, but it's often just translated. He tells a riddle and he speaks a parable. Mm -hmm. And so I do think you're, you're losing something. And I often find the is, 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 uh, almost too literal if, if not sometimes in its yeah. uh translating what do you make of and do you have like a position on these um literal versus dynamic translations yeah i mean if you're if you're producing a modern translation in english or something you want to be intelligible right you want people to be understanding what they're reading for the purposes of like scholarship i'm interested in um yeah, on what end of the spectrum were they literal or a little more fluid, a little more dynamic, uh, free, so to speak? And it's really a spectrum. I mean, it just totally depends on the grammatical construction of the, the translators maybe felt comfortable saying he died a death. Or maybe some other translator said, oh, this, this sounds really weird in our language. We're just going to say he died. So it's nice. The nice thing for scholars is that, in general, the Gettys Bible is quite on the literalistic end of the spectrum. It's also a Semitic language, so you can do some of those Semitic constructions, grammatical constructions, which were already in the Hebrew, and it doesn't sound weird. I mean, to, to my understanding, you could maybe say some of these things, and they, they don't sound odd. Does that sound right to you? Yeah, it's very strange. I presented a, a paper one time for the Orthodox Center of the Advancement of Biblical Studies, some of the people that go to SBL. And it was, because it was strange to me, as far as I know, there wasn't a lot of Hebrew consultation uh, in the Gittes Bible. It's predominantly this old Greek. And yet the word for um, 
bow and arrow or for arrow, pasht and pasht, was the exact same in the good as in the Hebrew. Now you could say that's random chance. You could say it's because of the Semitic languages, but it's almost curious because they like could there not have been some other expression uh, having only dealt with the Greek terms they somehow used to the Hebrew. And now it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes there are straightforward things like the things that bug me is like the name Saul. The g is for that is Sa'ad. And it's so obviously there, but because they're transliterating the names from Greek, it, it ends up sounding differently, Sa'ol, and it doesn't really have any meaning at all. And so like, there's definitely room to make like new good translations where you just make it as close to the Hebrew as possible. And <laughs> that might be a project for me or for some budding scholar um, out there one day. So um, in, in the talking about this translation, one of the things uh, my Hebrew teacher, Father Paul Tarazi would always point to is this prologue of the wisdom of Sirach. And I have to look for it further, but I've never actually come across it in Amharic. I'm wondering if um, if that is something that you've seen translated, because it has your name in it too, Bar Jesus or Bar Joshua. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I wonder, what have you ever seen anything about that uh, prologue? Because in it with itself, it speaks about translation and how ultimately right, you right. want and to desire the the original, which we we don't necessarily have the the manuscript of what the Septuagint was translated from. Yeah, yeah, I know for the for some textual traditions they keep the prologue and then some don't. I mean, um, the Greek the Greek text of Ben Sira I think included, of course, and it's this um, yeah it's an interesting book because it is itself a translation from Hebrew of the guy's grandfather. And he, he has this prologue of saying, um, basically you can't, you can't, there's no small difference is the key phrase. There's no small difference when you're translating from Hebrew to Greek. And so he's kind of making an author's apology saying, look, if I couldn't represent everything in Greek that my grandfather wrote, uh, you're gonna have to excuse me basically and it's just so fascinating because it's this ancient recognition of the whole translation problem of you there's just some things you can't represent completely in another language yes i think it was our friend Berahat again who recently said that great italian phrase i'm not going to butcher the italian so translator traitor and yeah. they're, they're like homophones in italian yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which is funny for any translator to hear or interpreter to hear. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's so great. In in the kind of uh, big picture, without getting into everything, because I think it would be helpful. Um, is is there any way that you could summarize or encourage people to read the the Book of Esther? For me, it's always stuck out the fact that God is not kind of explicitly there and, and I, we talked about names earlier uh she has the sort of the hadessa name but then also the the esther name uh, i'm wondering if there's anything you could say about uh, the book of esther there yeah yeah we could talk all day about esther um yeah how to read the book of esther so i mean the thing is like it wasn't just a problem it's not just a modern problem because you had these ancient uh, scribes reading the Hebrew text, which doesn't mention God. And at some point somebody said, no, 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 this is wrong. We have, we have to add God somewhere. And so, and also there's no reference to praying explicitly. There's no reference to anything we usually associate with Jewish practice, right? They have there's fasting though, right? Fasting, that's it, yeah. right? So what does that mean? I don't know. But at some point these ancient readers were like, we need to do something about this. What's this? this nice Jewish girl doing, marrying this pagan king. And, and we need to, we need to have a prayer by her. And so in the Greek versions, and then these daughter versions, including this, they include prayers by Esther and Mordecai. They include references to God. Wow. Um, there's a, a dream of Mordecai at the beginning. And then uh, it's interpreted. It's revealed to him at the end. And so, um, 
what you want if you think that's a satisfying uh solution you know maybe you do so there are people who say well what the greek version was doing was it was making explicit what was already implicit in the hebrew there are people who will say that if your religious tradition accepts you know the text that includes the prayers you're going to you're going to tend to go that way right you're going to say this is a faithful uh version of the scripture that's clarifying if you don't come from that position if you're a protestant and you say oh the hebrew text we need the hebrew text only the hebrew text you're going to say oh these these people they were falsifying you know they they wanted to add these prayers and so it's just kind of this very fascinating problem of like almost what is the book of esther because there's different versions there's the septuagint and then there's these latin versions and then there's these hebrew versions and which one do we include in our bible because christians have been reading these different versions for centuries absolutely and and it's so great that that you have been looking at it how did you settle on studying for example the greek text and is it because of these ec the extras that it has yeah yeah exactly like it has these extras it has not only these big editions but smaller editions here and there and not only do you have a septuagint version but you have another greek version of esther called the alpha text um you have the ancient jewish historian josephus who has a slightly different version he may have been reading some kind of septuagint like text but which was also different you also have old latin version which um also has differences and so you have at least four versions and then much more minor differences in these daughter versions the armenian is coptic and so i'm fascinating in just all these differences and similarities you know how how do we understand um kind of the family tree that's what we're trying to construct more or less how did these texts originate how did they relate to each other that's fascinating, yeah. And I have reviewed things like television or movie film adaptations of scripture, like The Chosen, which is one of the biggest ones now. And I love how they're even independently funded structurally. And I jokingly have said, but you know, serious critique that they're kind of digital diatessarons in that they're it's not like season one is Matthew and season two is Mark and Luke and John and so on and so forth. They're trying to put all of these things together as if it's one story. And the early church after a while certainly rejected that after using it for a while. Um, but I wonder, uh, you know, my wife and I have seen the movie One Night with the King, which is an adaptation of uh, Esther. I wonder if you've seen that or if you've seen any of the other film or TV adaptations and, and what you make of, of those. Yeah, yeah, that's a really nice phrase, digital diatessaron. This this idea that this this TV series is basically doing what these ancient writers did is they're they're trying to harmonize the differences, put them all together uh, of the gospels. And with Esther, it's a very similar phenomenon. Uh, my friend John Dunn, D U N N E, wrote a book. It's it's very readable. At, at, you know, you have to be a, scholar to read it it's called um esther's elusive god and he discusses these film adaptations of esther uh, one night with the king and also veggie tales and all these other ones and basically what he points out is a lot of these film adaptations are doing more or less the same thing that the ancient uh translators or, or writers were doing so you watch this one night with the king or some other adaptation of esther and you've got Esther praying or mentioning God. And you're like, wait a minute, this is not in the Hebrew text. But it's doing the same thing as people read the book of Esther, whether they're ancient people or modern people. And they're like, wait a minute, these people should be praying. And unintentionally, they've kind of created a, a yeah, digital kind of reworking of Esther in a way. Um, it's, it's just this kind of cross historical cross-cultural phenomenon of like when people encounter scripture there's these gaps right there's always these gaps like what was abraham thinking when he was about to sacrifice isaac and whenever you try to adapt scripture 
whether it's rewriting it or producing a, a play or film or whatever, people always want to fill these gaps. And what's so funny to me is like they they often fill it in the same way unintentionally. That's amazing. I um, as, as we close out, I wanted to ask you some advice and thank you so much for your your time today. I often get people who have a desire to read scripture, but they just don't know where to start. Would you ever advise someone begin with the book of Esther? Is there a reason to do that? Or do you point them elsewhere? Sure. I don't know where to begin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, after some, sometimes when people take a uh, Hebrew class, you know, Esther is, you know, reasonably short, uh, reasonably, reasonably manageable. It's got a lot of interesting issues. Yeah, yeah, I'd say Esther's a good good place as any to start. Yeah. yeah. And and of course, you know, people do these themes. I think you mentioned one of the uh it might be a feminist perspective on Genesis or something like that, like women of the Bible. People do yeah. categories like that. And so sometimes there are I have friends and family who are involved in like women's only Bible study, for example. And the um there was a, a magazine I found earlier this year just at the supermarket. And they had women of the Bible, and it was just in a magazine. I bought it. I was like, yeah. I was, I was interested. I wanted to see what they had to say about scripture in the <laughs> right next to the gum <laughs> and the soda. Right. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I only say that because you clearly have some internal motivation for reading these texts. I have some internal motivation, and sometimes you know, I don't know if it's. A natural phenomenon or something that you could nurture and so i just try to ask people um what is it that that gets you going because i i haven't been able to identify yet and so so thank you for that is there anything that you would like to plug or point people to any of your writings or to follow you anywhere or you don't want them to follow you <laughs> yeah, you can follow me on twitter uh you can just look up my name joshua alfaro you'll probably find me and then um on the twitter there's a link to my academia.edu page and if uh, you see something i've published and you can't access it just let me know and i'll send you a pdf i would just say to people like don't be scared of studying don't be scared of scholarship you don't have to um, give up your faith convictions you don't have to give up your traditions you might have to re-examine them or think about them differently but uh, I think the worst thing scholars can do is kind of have this overbearing authority and say, um, look, I'm the scholar. I know what I'm talking about. And um, you person of faith, you person uh, in the pew at church are wrong. And here's let, let me tell you really how to read the Bible. That's not what scholars should be doing. Scholars should be helping people to uh, encounter their traditions, encounter scripture in a meaningful way. So I would just say, don't be scared of scholarship. Thank you kindly for that and for being soft with the people. Yes.